Yesterday, we, I took the teens down to Ankeny, Iowa for uh, a youth activity hosted by Faith Baptist Bible College. And it was a good uh, three and a half hour drive and the Lord provided safe travels and smooth, smooth sailing as it were and uh, just a, a great time together. Um, we heard some good preaching from pa our Pastor Pat Odell. Uh, we had him in last year for our missions conference, if you recall. And we were able to connect with him a little bit afterwards and say hi to him and greet him for liberty. And he wanted to pass along his greetings to us as well. He thoroughly enjoyed his time with us last year and just getting to know some of you and being able to minister to us and us to him. Um, but during this event, we also enjoyed some fun activities outside. And those activities involved a lot of uh, inflatables and faith had uh, they had this um, connection to this company where they have a number of students working and at this at this inflatable company and, and they're able to get a lot of different kinds of massive inflatables over to, at their campus and it was a lot of fun and the teens uh, convinced me to participate and, and join them in some of those uh, uh, some of those activities and um, I came away recognizing how out of shape I am and how out of breath I was after just a couple runs through the obstacle course or whatnot. And I was thoroughly humbled at one point, being beaten by Savannah and Jordan. And uh, so that was good for me. Um, I proceeded afterwards to the coffee shop to try to just cool down. It was hot and humid towards the end of the day and they, had a, a, they have a nice facility there and so I thought I would try to get some study in before the, or during the last session or try to fit something in there. And as I got into the coffee shop, I was just like hit with the scent and it wasn't coffee, it was body odor. It was just all these teenagers and it was strong. And uh, it, was, uh, it was a bit um, repulsive. I, I couldn't study there. I had to go find the library instead. But uh, it's not easy, and I'm speaking for myself too, to be around people that, that just, they, they, when we smell bad, it's hard to be around each other. And uh, this is something I ran into when I worked security downtown Minneapolis. Part of my job was to, to interact with some of the homeless people that would come and occupy some of the, the, the parking garages or some of the, the alleyways or the inside uh, the skyway of downtown St. Paul and Minneapolis. And, and it was often that I would interact with these folks and it, was, it wasn't always easy. And um, they, it, was, it was sad on many levels um, to see what they have become as people and as image bearers of God and to see the difficult lives that they were living. Um, it was also difficult to see how dejected they were and avoided by other people and how other people just looked down on them so obviously and so apparently. And it was, uh, it was they were, they were um, looked on as just less than people. I, I remember interacting with some clients that would just, the way they spoke of them, it was, it was sad. But they were, they were uh, avoided at all, people would, cross the street to go around someone that was sleeping on the sidewalk so they didn't have to go near them, um, whether it was just the uh, appearance of them being there and the uncomfortableness of, of walking around them nearby in their presence, or the, the smell that was quite obvious and um, fragrant. And so that was, that was also a, a difficult challenge sometimes. But in our text this morning, we have a group of people who were equally treated in many ways like this. They were repulsed and, and dejected and avoided at all costs, the tax collectors and the sinners, as we have just heard read to us from Brother Timothy. And these individuals were contracted to um, receive and, and, um, and demand a tax on goods and passage and, um, and income, and so they would take these taxes and they would send them to Herod Antipas, and then Herod Antipas would send the proper amount to the Roman government. And these, uh, these tax collectors were allowed to raise rates as they saw fit and to collect, uh, to skim off the top and take, take whatever they thought was what they wanted, really. There wasn't a lot of oversight as to what they could do. Now, if it was exorbitantly amount, obviously that's gonna raise a lot of problems and they didn't want that, so there was some there was some ceiling that they couldn't quite hit. There was, there was a tolerance there that they had to be mindful of. But these, these individuals were, uh, were looked down upon by most, 
um, religious Jews of the day. And, uh, and these, these, the taxes in Galilee, for example, were forwarded on to, like I said, Antipas and then to Rome. And um, Herod would um, operate it in a way that took, looked at the, the taxes to be collected as kind of like a franchise, and he would, he would hire out the highest bidder. And such franchises were a lucrative business. Tax collectors had a, had a certain amount, like I said, that ha they had to collect. And they would, uh, they would employ uh, other employees, thugs really, these individuals that would enforce the tax um, or to ensure their safety because they were, they were hated by many. Um, all, all of that was just their, their whole occupation who they were as individuals was really just anathema to the Jewish people who believed God was the only one to whom they should pay taxes to. Tax collectors were viewed as traitors to their people. They were classified as unclean. They were, they were barred from the synagogues. They were also forbidden to give testimony in Jewish court because they were considered liars and cheats. Now, except for the fact that Jesus comes to these, ki th these kinds of people, we have no one else that's really paying any kind of attention to them, um, any positive attention to them, I should say. They weren't known, or, uh, yeah, they weren't known for their physical stench, but really their, their spiritual repulsiveness. And this is what we see here in this passage. And what, what we will come to see as we enter into this text is that the grace of Jesus transcends all that. The grace of Jesus calls sinners and he confronts the self-righteous. This is what Luke is putting before us as he continues to um, develop the ministry, uh, continue to convey to us and, and record the, the, the history and the, and the episodes of Jesus's ministry and the events that unfolded and really helping us see who Jesus is as he, as he pulls back the layers of, of Jesus's heart, as it were, to help us re see and appreciate the essence of who Jesus is. And here we see the compassion and the mercy, the grace of Jesus as it calls sinners and confronts the self-righteous. The fact of the matter is that scripture tells us that none are righteous. All have turned aside. No one seeks after God on his own accord. And Luke reminds us that this, of this by revealing again the extent at which Jesus is willing to go to rescue these kinds of people. Sinners like you and I. Sinners like the tax collectors who were so hated and despised. And we're going to see some some uh, response, we're going to see two primary responses in this text. And I want us to consider two outcomes as we consider the sinner and the self-righteous response to Jesus' calling as Jesus comes and he calls sinners to repentance. And here we have in Luke 5, at the end of the chapter here, starting with verse 27, And I'm in the wrong, I'm in the wrong book. I was in John. I'm like, that, that's not right. Verse 27 in chapter 5, he says, After that he went out and, and noticed a tax collector named Levi sitting in the tax booth. And he said to him, follow me. And he left everything behind and he got up and began to follow him. And Levi gave a big reception for him in his house. And there was a great crowd of tax collectors and other people who were reclining at the table. Now, What's happening here? We, we have a, another clear picture of God's work, God's grace, I should say, at work in the life of the most unlikely candidate, Levi, also known as Matthew. Matthew, the one who writes the gospel of Matthew. And here Jesus calls him, not only saves him, but calls him as a disciple and, a, and eventually an apostle. It's easy for us to give up on someone. It's easy to believe that they're a lost case, that the fact that they have such a hardened heart and a resistance to the gospel, they're just lost. They're never going to turn to Christ. They're never going to confess that Jesus is Lord. And Levi here is a great reminder to us that we mustn't stop believing or praying for these kinds of individuals. Jesus comes, he recognizes Levi's heart, um, and, and he sees 
no doubt that he was searching. He was wanting something. He was miserable in his current estate. And he just says, follow me. And he gets up and follows him. And he, he uh, turns his back on his current occupation and all the wealth and the, and the privilege that he had as a tax collector and the perks that he had working for Herod and uh, the Roman government. And he turns his back on that and he leaves and then he goes and throws uh, a celebration party and he, he, and he invites Jesus into his house along with a great crowd, Luke says, a great crowd of tax collectors and other people. So Luke here provides us a picture of what the right response is to Jesus' calling. And we see that with my first point on the outline, if you're following along, the humble response of the sinner. We see that in the verses I just read, which is repentance. The humble response of a sinner is repentance. Turning from something to something else. So we have a clear picture of Levi turning his back on his former life. He forsakes his former lifestyle. He forsakes his former lifestyle. The humble sinner will give it up. His, his old way of living. Luke describes Matthew as just leaving everything behind. Now, we have a hard time leaving things behind and letting go. I remember just, you know, I was reminded of this when we were visiting family. And we were in Michigan and then Pennsylvania. And in both instances, it was, it was hard. And this was leaving good things behind, our family and our friends. But I also re was reminded of some of the things that I had left behind um, when I was in college or high school and, and some of these belongings that I had. And whether it was clothes or trophies or um, antlers from a deer or you know just random things that had been stored away um, that I prized and I treasured when I was in high school and when I was in college. And it was interesting to me to, to now reflect back on that and go, wow, none of that has much value to me anymore. There's some sentimental value, but not much of it. I, I, I left that behind. Now, it was harder at one point when we got married and moved out to try to figure out what I wanted to keep and what I didn't. And, and, uh, but, but we have a hard time leaving things behind. And sometimes it's not trivial things like that. Sometimes it's, it's more uh, intimate things. Um, bitterness, um, anger, frustration over past experiences and how people have treated us. Maybe we do have a hard time letting go of certain idols of our heart, certain pleasures that we enjoy certain material, worldly possessions, perhaps even relationships that aren't good for us, that are toxic or negative, leading us down the wrong road. I had a, 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 good, a good conversation with one of my brothers who was uh, struggling through that a little bit of, uh, um, in his own life as he was dealing with some influences in his life that he he enjoyed, he enjoyed being around certain people. And these were, it was apparent that these were negative influences on his life and that was a struggle for him and he had to really work through that. And so we had a good conversation about that and he recognized his need and, and his, his desire to, to, to or his, uh, how he's, he recognized the value of Jesus and walking for him, walking towards him and with him versus walking with these, with these friends that were not of a, a good influence on his life. Matthew knew that he was a sinner and that his only hope for forgiveness lay in God's mercy. And in time, like the rest of the 12 disciples, he would come to understand more fully and believe the truth that Jesus was God. I don't know how much Matthew truly understood or believed in this moment, but he knew enough to see his need for this man, Jesus and later recognizing him as God himself. Jesus forgave him based on his repentant heart and called him to be a disciple and later to be an apostle. Matthew's 
immediate response revealed the genuineness of his desire for righteousness and salvation. He left, like I said, everything behind. He got up, he began to follow Jesus, it says. Jesus says, follow me, and Matthew responds, or Levi responds. The, the change in his life was miraculous. It was apparent. It was transformative. The tough, hard-nosed tax collector became a humbled man by the grace of God. And Luke says that he followed Jesus. The aorist tense of this verb, to get up, coupled with an imperfect tense to... Uh, to follow Jesus illustrates Matthew's responsiveness here and his decisive decision to break from the past. This is to say he, he right then and there became one of Jesus' disciples. But how, does, how, how is this following depicted here? How, how, does, how does Luke kind of um, help us see this more fully and be more convinced that there was genuine conversion? Well, the immediacy of it certainly but more specifically, he, he fellowshiped with Jesus. Someone who is a repentive sinner turns from their sin and turns to Jesus. That is to say, they, they fellowship, they commune with, they submit themselves under the, the authority and the lordship of Christ. And Matthew does that. It's apparent that he does. Here we have a banquet that he throws. It says he has a... Um, a Levi gave a big reception for him in, in his house, and there was a great crowd of tax collectors and other people reclining at the table with them. Matthew here is spending time with Jesus, honoring him as a guest, giving him his very best. It was, he said, uh, um, Luke says, a great, a megas banquet, huge, large, probably, probably cost a pretty penny to host something like this. And it says he was reclining, which implies they spent time together. This wasn't just a come in and, and have a, a short, quick meal with me. He spent lengthy time with Jesus and his disciples. And when you host something like this for someone, you are making quite a statement. You are aligning with that individual. You're disclosing your agreement and your support of this person. Matthew isn't just using words, but his actions evidence his conviction and his conversion here. But it doesn't stop there. Matthew not only invites Jesus and his disciples to celebrate um, his changed life and the forgiveness he had received, but he invites his friends. So not only does he, he, fall, he fellowships with Jesus as another evidence of his changed heart, but here he seeks the conversion of others. He seeks the conversion of others. The transformative grace of Christ changed this man's affections, which are no longer controlled by wealth and pleasure, but, but for Jesus and for lost souls. All this is evidenced of, of, uh, by new longings, and new aspirations, new affections, a new mind, a new will. In, in short, he became a new creature here. And I don't think I'm, I'm stretching this or reading into this too much. Th this seems consistent with what Paul says in 2 Corinthians 5.17, where he says, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creature. The old things have passed away. Behold, new things have come. And here, I believe Matthew is celebrating the new things that have come, the new heart that he has. Matthew is demonstrating his desire to follow Jesus by this reception he, he throws and the, the guests that he invites to hear Jesus. He is... Um, Levi here, Matthew, is, is uh, affected by the fact that we, we read this from Psalm 40, how Jesus pulled him out of the miry pit and set his feet on a rock. He, he saved this man. It, it, is this kind of behavior seen in us as born-again believers? Are we committed to prioritizing Jesus in our lives over our stuff and over our things and feelings? Do we see him as more valuable than gold and silver or make, you know, making money or establishing a reputation among our friends and relatives? Or perhaps sinful habits and idols of our hearts have distracted us and hindered us in our love for Christ. Perhaps we need to be praying like David more in Psalm 51, 
where he's confessing sin, but also saying, Lord, restore unto me the joy of my salvation. Restore the passion for souls. Like Levi, may we view God and see the joy that we can have in Christ. May it dispel any preconceived fear of what others might think of us. It doesn't seem like Matthew was concerned with that. He invites all his buddies along. Though he forsook that, and he's following now this religious teacher, this rabbi, Jesus, and yet he, he doesn't seem to be concerned by maybe some of the criticism or the, the negative feedback from his friends and colleagues. We should want others. We should want for others what Jesus has done for us. And I think this is, this is clear in, in Levi's case here. Unfortunately, not everyone responds as Levi does. Luke includes some dialogue with the Pharisees, like he does often, in order to convey a contrasting response that stands as a warning for us today, which is the, the prideful response of the, selfish, of the self-righteous individual, which is rejection, rejection. The prideful response of the self-righteous is rejection. Look at this in verse 30. He says, uh, The Pharisees and the scribes began grumbling at his disciples, saying, Why do you eat and drink with the tax collectors and sinners? And Jesus answered and said to them, It is not those who are well who need a physician, but those who are sick. And I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. And then they go on to complain about something else, which we're going to talk about momentarily here. This, this was, um, you need to understand kind of like the layout and the picture of what's, what's happening here. So in those times, to have a big feast wasn't a private matter. It was a public event in, in, in many ways um, because it was seen by the public from the outside. As you walk by these houses, you could see the partying going on. Sometimes the, the reclining was right off, on, off the street and anyone could just sit and watch and observe what was going on in these open air kind of um, banquet parties. They weren't necessarily enclosed. They may have some curtains or, you know, to, to keep uh, some privacy there. Um, but it was, it was obvious to those passing by what was happening and who Jesus was with. And, uh, and uh, it was apparent to the, tax, or the, the Pharisees and the scribes as they were standing probably near enough to see what was happening. They didn't want to get too close to associate themselves with, with this rabble or these, uh, these degenerates. And uh, so they, they complain, they grumble, they murmur. And uh, this, this is what's going on here. They, they, to eat and to share company with, with such people was considered an act of great impurity and in, in need of cleansing. And the Pharisees prided themselves on separation. In fact, that's what their name means, separated ones. And uh, they separated themselves unto the, the study of the Torah and the scriptures and to prayer. They dedicated themselves to prayer and fasting. But they also separated themselves from the common man. And they took it too far to the point where they, they excluded others. They saw themselves as these, these um, holy individual, holier individuals than, than anyone else. And they looked down on everyone else. And they developed this reputation. And uh, their rejection of Jesus can be seen by three acts of pride, which may suddenly find their way in our hearts and minds as well. So I want us to consider this as a possibility of our own hearts, and and um, perhaps there's there's need for confession here as we look at the response of the self righteous. Number one, they rely on self identity. They rely on self identity. And so the question posed to us is, do we? Do we rely on our self-identity? It's likely that their grumbling and their complaining had more to do with the increased popularity that Jesus was experiencing at this time. And, and what he, as he was gaining this, uh, this attention, it was a threat to their influence over the people and their ability to draw even more disciples uh, because they, they saw Jesus' teaching um, and, and leading future disciples away as they recognize that maybe they didn't need to separate themselves so much. And, and Jesus seems to be speaking very convincingly and wisely 
as he explains the scriptures. And so they're, they're frustrated, no doubt, by what's happening and, and all the attention he's getting. He's, uh, he's, they're also probably grumbling and complaining over the fact that he's, he's fraternizing with the likes of publicans and sinners. So what's their complaint overall? What, what, are they, what are they complaining about? Well, just that, that Jesus' disciples were not remaining separate. They weren't acting like disciples like those of John and those of the Pharisees and scribes. They were, they were fellowshipping with sinners. They were eating and dining. Now, it's interesting enough that they, were, uh, they confront the disciples and they don't, they don't necessarily want to talk to Jesus. But as they were kind of discussing or, or uh, kind of not really harassing, but they were having a dialogue with, the, they were confronting the disciples and Jesus overheard. Right? And so then he responds to them. Um, what the question exposes, before we get to Jesus' response, notice how the question that they're asking exposes the scribes and Pharisees as proud, focused on externals and hypocritical, imaging themselves to be the, the religious elite, and they were in reality void of any grace, and they were strangers of salvation and forgiveness. So Jesus here turns his back on the outwardly immoral and focused on and he focused on transforming repentant sinners into holy people. And we see that here as he says, I have come to call not the righteous but sinners to repentance. Their reliance on their identity will be their demise. It will be their death. Like a physician, Jesus says that he has come to heal, not just physically, but but spiritually as well. He has come to heal hearts, to make new what was dead. Why do we go to the doctor? Why do we go to the doctor? Well, we go to the doctor because we recognize that we need help, that we're sick, and secondly, that we cannot help ourselves. We need intervention. We need a professional to treat us. We need medication to help us. Unfortunately, the Pharisees did not see their need for a doctor. They did not see their need for Jesus. But why are the Pharisees blinded to their true identity, which was their pride? They were completely reliant on themselves and absorbed by their legalistic lifestyle and their man-made religion. This is what happens when we believe lies and maintain skewed views of ourselves and self-righteous thoughts of, of ourselves and how we act in comparison to others, perhaps. They saw no sin in themselves, no, no good or, or value in others around them. So the second point of evidence of their pride is their trust in self-performance, self-performance. And of course, this is seen all throughout the Gospels as, as Jesus interacts with them. They hear, they question the disciples' commitment to fasting. The Pharisees reproached Jesus, um, his, his disciples, by, for violating Jewish religious customs by failing to fast or offer ritual prayers, which was the custom for disciples of, of any kind, really, uh, of religious disciples, those of John, those of the Pharisees. Luke gives examples there. And uh, fasting was one of the three major practical expressions of the Jewish piety, along with, with prayer and, and giving of alms. And so this was, uh, this was um, a point of contention for them that they could bring before Jesus and his disciples. However, the Pharisees, they fasted, they fasted about twice a week, according to the, the sources. And uh, you can see that in Luke 18, 12 as well. But the Mosaic Law, interesting enough, only mandated a fast on the Day of Atonement. So just, I mean, bare minimum, fast just on the Day of Atonement. That's all that's, all that's required. According to Leviticus 16, the Lord commanded the people of Israel to humble their souls, which is a, a reference to fasting. And uh, these religious elites were adding to the law and they were priding themselves on these spiritual disciplines. But we ourselves must be careful not to judge others or look down on others simply because their convictions or their standards do not match ours. Beware of trusting in legalistic methods or metrics as a means to find favor with God or to demonstrate to others a level of spirituality. This is so easy to do. And I'm, I'm afraid that we do it often, and I, I'm thinking of my own heart and how easy this is. 
to fall into, this legalistic kind of thinking and mentality. This, of course, led to uh, an overemphasis on externals rather than the internal needs of the heart. And this is, this is blatant, this is so obvious as you, reckon, as you um, read through the, the issues that the Pharisees had and the, and the points of tension and, and um, confrontation that they had with Jesus. Unfortunately, what we see here on the part of the Pharisees, and perhaps even in our own lives, is a habit of finding fault with others, comparing ourselves as a way to maybe just make ourselves feel better, puff ourselves up a little bit. At least I'm not that bad. At least I don't look like that, or I don't have those problems or those, those issues. Those, uh, I don't struggle with that form of depression or discouragement. Um, we begin to look down on others rather than seeing their needs and demonstrating love and mercy like Jesus did. Unlike Levi, who sought the conversions of others, the Pharisees sought the fault of others. Thirdly there, seek, they, they, they sought, or just, they, the pride was evidenced by seeking the faults of others. Jesus confronts their faulty thinking in the following verses by offering up three different illustrations. We'll work through these quickly here. Um, he, he says, um, following their, their point of conflict there in verse 33, Jesus said to them in 34, you cannot make the attendance of the bridegroom fast while the bridegroom is with them, can you? But the days will come and, and when the bridegroom is taken away from them, then they will fast in those days. Now, what's going on here? Why is Jesus bringing up a bridegroom here? And, and what's, what's the connection here? Jesus, Jesus reveals his identity here once again, but this time by mentioning or focusing on the fact that he is a bridegroom. And, and you could draw a connection or a reference point back to Isaiah 62, verse 5, where Isaiah states, As the bridegroom rejoices over the bride, so your God will rejoice over you. But I think Jesus here introduces himself as the bridegroom, which the New Testament will then use later to talk about Christ's relationship to the church, his bride. Uh, Jesus was demonstrating also the foolishness of fasting while he, the Messiah, was presently with them. Why would you fast um, if, if, if he was physically present with them, which was something you, you didn't do um, in, in the context of a wedding ceremony or uh, celebrations. You didn't do anything that resembled mourning or solemn attitudes like fasting or disciplines like this. And Jesus says, no, my disciples don't need to fast. They're with, they're with me, the bridegroom. They're communing with me, and I'm, I'm communing with them, and there's communication, and, and there's no need for this. And then he gives, up, he gives a, another couple illustrations here. He talks about the patching of an old cloth with the new cloth and filling old wineskins with new wine. And I think this illustrates the fact that Jesus is not attempting to introduce something new to the law or to reform the law, but to fulfill the law. The gospel cannot be patched into Judaism or any other system of salvation by works. His teaching was completely at odds with that of the Jewish leaders. They, they viewed themselves as righteous, and Jesus preached the necessity of repentance. And he's like, it doesn't work. You can't put new wine in old wineskins. You can't put a new cloth to patch an, or a new, a new patch to patch a, an old cloth. It's, it's, it's futile. It's not going to work. They focused on external ceremony ritual and outward observances of the law, Christ focused on the heart. They loved the approval of man, but he offered the approval of God. So what, so what happened? What happened here? The scribes and the Pharisees had badly misunderstood what God's purpose in giving the law was. He did not give the law as a means of achieving self-righteousness, which seems to be the thought process here, but to provoke self condemnation, to be aware of your sin, to, to offer or to provide conviction for our fallen nature and our behavior and our proneness to wander from God, to um, provoke repentance and a pleading to God for mercy. 
the law is uh, our tutor to lead us to Christ so that we might so we may be justified by faith Galatians 3:24 says so Jesus then likens the Pharisees to those who are content with the old wine he says they have been they have been drinking this old wine and they have no desire to taste the new you can see that at the end of 39 there the old is good enough this is the attitude of the Pharisees. This is the attitude of the religious elites, the, those that were operating under legalistic forms and, and methods and metrics. They, they, they were fine with it. They didn't want to taste and see that Jesus was all they needed. For those unwilling to leave their false religions and embrace the gospel, there is no hope of salvation. No one, Jesus says, no one comes to the Father but through me. Through me, I am the way, the truth, and the life. So the church's goal is not to make unbelievers comfortable in their false religious systems or to help them assimilate Jesus into their, those other sim, um, systems. The commission that the Lord gave the church was to go and to make disciples and to baptize them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I commanded you, and lo, I am with you always to the end of the earth. Matthew 28. Jesus here, he engaged the sinner. He called the sinner. May we be like Levi and humbly come to Jesus, giving up everything that crowds out, um, that crowds out Jesus from our hearts, and minimizes our love for others. Live like Christ by following hard after him, fellowshipping with him and his church. This is why we need each other. We are the body of Christ. And in many ways, as we fellowship with one another, we're fellowshipping with Christ. And engage the sinner. How, how, can we, how can we evangelize if we're not engaging those that are difficult to reach and those that are repugnant and repulsive to us at first sight? How can we be instruments in God's hands to, admin, to, to communicate his grace to them and mercy if we're not engaging with unbelievers? Love them enough to share the same gospel that transformed your sinful undeserving heart and don't do it just because of what God did for you but do it because of the joy that there is in your heart and also do it for the glory of God I mean there's so many reasons why we should be engaging and calling sinners to repentance through Jesus Christ oh may we be like like Levi here but more importantly may we may we be like Christ in how we conduct our lives and how we go about living our week and seeing the needs around us, fellowshipping with Jesus, forsaking our past, not returning to our old way of living. Let's ask God's help and let's continue to live for him and run to him. He's a savior who is strong and kind. And there is so much joy and satisfaction and value in following hard after Christ. Let's, let's pray. Father, thank you for this text. Thank you for these reminders of your love and your compassion for us, for sinners, the most despised people. As Paul says, the, he, he is the chief of sinners. And yet you came to save the sinner to seek, to call to repentance those who would hear and those who will believe. Help us to continue to believe. Help us in our faith and our walk with you to be all the more re resolved in our heart and committed to following after you, to fellowshipping after you, to seeking the conversions of those around us for your glory to see others worshiping you and communing with you should be our greatest desire and treasure. Father, thank you again for this day. May you be honored and glorified with it. We pray this in Christ's name. Amen.